Welcome everyone to this evening's History Revealed program. Uh, this is an ongoing partnership between the Eastside Freedom Library and the Ramsey County Historical Society. I'm Peter Ratcliffe, the co-executive director of the Eastside Freedom Library, um, and we're delighted to have you with us this evening. I'm going to turn things over for a moment to my colleague, Robin Priestley, from the Ramsey County Historical Society. Thank you, Peter. Um, we're always so excited, especially to introduce a new book to everyone. And thank you all for coming tonight. We will be keeping your cameras and microphones turned off for the time being. But after the presentation and the film, you'll be able to unmute. We'll let everybody unmute and you can turn on your videos. Um, and we can all chat together. Um, but in the meantime, please feel free to put your questions and comments in the chat box and we'll be reading those off later. Um, we will be having a great program coming up in September. We're just finalizing the date with archeologist Jeremy Nino is gonna come and talk about archeology span and archeology span pro project that he oversaw and did with help of volunteers and other archeologists at Fort Snelling, which is gonna be really fascinating. So that will be in September, we'll take a look at that. And again, please check both the Eastside Freedom Library and the Ramsey County Historical Society websites for upcoming programs. We have a lot going on in September. We have Applefest at our historic site Gibbs Farm, which is always fun. And we are planning our annual celebration in September as well. Um, next week, we have a great program. Um, David Backus is gonna come and talk about the journals of famous wilderness author and naturalist um, Sigurd Olson. And that will be, um, what date is that? That's August 19th. So it'll be a week from tonight. And please join us for that. And you can sign up on our website. So I'd like to acknowledge the sacred Dakota land. Minnesota Makoche, the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds, is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from these sacred Dakota lands. Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to preserving our past, informing our present, and inspiring our future. Part of doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges facing the Dakota people just as we celebrate their contributions and the contributions of all the Dakota people and other Indigenous peoples. You can find our full land acknowledgement statement on our website, which is www.rchs.com, which includes actionable ways in which Ramsey County Historical Society pledges to honor the Dakota and other Indigenous peoples of Minnesota Makoche. So we are committed to presenting the stories and histories of all in our community, and RCHS is so proud to partner with the Eastside Freedom Library, and we're pleased to bring you tonight's program. So thank you, Peter. Thank you, Robin. Um, this is really a very special uh, event for us, for the Eastside Freedom Library, and for me personally. Um, we again and again say that we want to be a place where knowledge is produced, not just accessed. And it is very meaningful to us that our dear friend Greg Poferl who daily cleans the bathrooms, who occasionally trims the branches that lurk over our roof to keep the squirrels and the raccoons from leaping onto our roof and eating holes in it. Uh, <laughs> Greg has done so much uh, to make the Eastside Freedom Library happen and be a place where people can find and build community. Um, I have known Greg for more than 30 years. Um, he was a national business agent in the American Postal Workers Union when we first met. Um, then he retired from that, went back to school and became a high school social studies teacher. And we worked together in that context. Um, somewhere along the way, Greg developed a love of puppets which has also made him an important part of our family um, and has really brought the power of puppetry into the labor movement. 
into the East Side Freedom Library. And then I was fortunate to attend Greg's second retirement celebration uh, when he ended his career as a social studies teacher at Creighton Durham Hall High School. And I immediately said to him, now we have a job for you at the East Side Freedom Library. And he has been with us ever since. In the midst of all of that, he has written this marvelous book that he is going to introduce to us tonight. Our format is gonna be a little bit different from what we have typically done. And that is that Greg has worked with our good friend and collaborator, David Zarat in creating a video um, 35 minutes long, which tells the story of the book. Um, and after that, we will have a conversation with your questions and comments first typed into the chat. Um, and then we will drop the veils and we can all see each other and hear each other um, and have a conversation. So I'm gonna turn things over to Greg, uh, who has some prefatory remarks to make. And then our very good colleague, Carla Reilly, uh, who makes video and Zoom and so many things work for us at the Eastside Freedom Library. Carla will spin the video, if that's the right verb, um, <laughs> after Greg makes his introduction. So I'm gonna render myself invisible and turn things over to Greg. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and up front, I'd like to make sure to thank Robin and the Ramsey County Historical Society, as well as you and Eastside Freedom Library for giving uh, me this opportunity in presenting my book tonight. Uh, you mentioned David Zarat, uh, former film producer at St. Paul Neighborhood Network uh, for his film editing. I appreciate it so much, good friend. Uh, also, Jenny Markert, a very special friend and colleague at Creighton Durham Hall. She's an English teacher, and she spent many months of encouragement and editing of the book. And um, she has just been uh, remarkable in that regard. And Peter, just, uh, you know, I end my book with you and Beth and Orso, but I just really wanted to make sure to thank you for the over 30 years of your support and membership. And with that, um, I'll turn it back to Carla so she can uh, spin the video. When I was encouraged by friends to write my autobiography, I thought of the American West author, William Kittredge, who when asked why study history, he responded, we live in stories. What we are is stories. We do things because of what is called character and our character is formed by the stories we learn to live in. When I reflected back on the stories I've learned to live in, I realized that my life was a connection of turning points. The decisions I made during those turns in life had consequences, sometimes good, sometimes bad. In telling my stories in part one, I hope to show how people, places, and events became such meaningful touchstones in my life. In part two, I share the stories I wrote for my wife, Mary Beth, our nine children, and 35 grandchildren. I hope these stories bring as much delight to the reader as I experienced during the 12 years writing them. Part one, while I was teaching at Creighton Durham Hall, I was often asked to speak to the ninth grade classes about growing up in St. Paul in the 1950s when they were reading Until They Bring the Streetcars Back by Stanley Gordon West. CDH has evolved into a racially and culturally diverse school. So I would begin my story by presenting my context. My story is from the perspective of a kid who lived in a white neighborhood went to grade school with white kids and attended Creighton High School at a time when only one African-American student was in our class, David Nins. My only friends of color in grade school were the caddies at Town & Country Golf Course who lived in the Rondo area. They were some of the best caddies and they were terrific three wall handball players. I remember when they taught me the card game Big Casino. I am sure they would see the 50s through a different, interesting lens. I tell the students if I wrote a book about the 50s, I would call it when they bring the pea shooters back. Then I take out my pea shooter with my bag of navy beans and ask the teachers if I could shoot it in the classroom. Oh, the joy of a perfectly placed shot at the clock across the room. Train, that was a familiar call from the outfield at the sandlot just east of Hamlin Avenue at Selby when a freight train was spat on its way from Minneapolis to St. Paul. 
clubs and bats were hastily thrown to the ground if we were quick enough to get across the track. We could safely hop the train from the outside track as it picked up speed on the downgrade. The best were the bike trails, starting from the woods at the north side of the summit bridge and running along the hills on both sides of the tracks as far as Jefferson Avenue. Along the way there were stretches of prairie grass with a few underground forts that were our headquarters when we would play capture the flag. On the west side of the tracks near Goodrich Avenue lived Shotgun Annie, who would fire her 410 loaded with birdshot if we ventured too close to her pro property. She had chickens. I don't think she ever fired directly at us, but our exaggerations of imminent danger lived on. My friends from Immaculate Heart of Mary and I took full advantage of McAllister College and all of its assets. We would often play baseball and softball on their fields and tennis on the courts, as well as find adventure on the fire escapes on, roof, on the roof of Old Main and the observatory where the current softball field is located. In the winter, the McAllister Outdoor Hockey Rink was usually available as long as we would shovel, and the warming house was always open. But then there's the alleys. Rags, Sheeny! When we heard the calls, rags, rags, we would hurriedly hide behind the garages and wait for the rag Sheeny to pass. I learned from my research at the Jewish Historical Society at the Elmer L. Anderson Library at the U of M that Sheeny was a derogatory slur applied to the Jewish rag merchants who would drive their horses and wagons through the alleys collecting rags, bacon grease, and other household stuff. Anti-Semitism kept many new immigrants from good jobs, and they were relegated to the least desirable jobs as rag merchants and scrappers. They were the first recyclers. They were a bit intimidating, yet we would dare each other to run up from behind to jump on the back of their wagons. We never made it. When we were within several yards from the wagon, he would turn and lightning snap his whip above our heads. We would wildly scatter with great excitement to boldly exclaim to each other, Yeah, wait till next time. I think the ragmen really liked kids and knew how to make our days in the alley fun. The alleys were such wonderful playgrounds. The milkmen and their delivery trucks were always a welcome sight. On hot summer days, we would always ask, well, beg, for a chunk of the crystal clear ice the milkmen had in abundance. What a treat. In the winter, before their early morning walks to Cretan, my brothers would sometimes open the paper cap to one of the milk bottles delivered on our back steps and scoop out some of the delicious frozen cream, which always rises to the top of the bottle. Since the alleys and streets were not usually plowed, you could run out into the alley and go sledding. And in the mornings on our way to Macklehart to Mary grade school, in our buckle-up rubber boots, we would often ride the bumpers of cars driving north on Saratoga Street. I am sure this adventurous method of travel faded when they started to plow the streets, and the newer cars didn't have those handy extended metal bumpers. My first real job was at Town & Country Golf Course, where I caddied during 5th through 8th grade. I was lucky to get hired so young, because at the time both my brothers caddied and knew the caddy master. My brother David carried for Dr. Kerry Middlecoff in the 1952 Open at Keller Golf Course. He was offered Sam Sneed, but David knew Sneed was a poor tipper, and he took Middlecoff, who won. David got a great tip. Distant memory in the early 1950s was St. Joseph's Orphanage, just two blocks from where my wife Mary Beth grew up on Brimhall and Randolph. The orphanage, is, the orphanage had farm buildings and a shop for the boys, and it was nestled in an area of apple orchards and open land. Mary Beth would often sneak away from her house and go down to visit the horses. Every year, my parents would take us up north to the Barrett's Resort on Round Lake near McGregor and then to Portage Camp Resort on Little Rainy Lake and Big Portage Lake near Bacchus for a two-week vacation. When we left, whoever was the first to say, we're off in a cloud of dust, would get a nickel. Today, the grandkids get a dollar. I remember tin boats, old ice boxes, actually boxes filled with sawdust to hold ice harvested from the lakes in the winter, small firewood sheds for the wood stoves, and outhouses that were replaced with modern plumbing in the mid-1950s. The Lipkeys were the first owners and builders of Portage Camp Resort. Ernie Lipke speared fish in the winter to sell in town and bootlegged during Prohibition. 
A garage, kind of a fruit cellar, was located under the house where Ernie used to store his booze and choke cherry wine, which Jerry, his son, and I sampled on occasion. Ernie was a Baptist and preached Bible readings before dinner. Jerry and I helped him gut pigs and clean chickens. Have you ever tried to hold on to the hind legs of a little pig? The farm kids introduced me to this challenge and how to run fast from a cherry bomb stuck in a fresh cow pie. Cow pie. I love those guys. I remember several mornings when I would roll my dad's mom mini swag out to fish for crappies on Rainy Lake. She would clean them and fry them up for breakfast. I have a photo of her and my maternal grandmother, Flossie O'Donnell, both wearing sundresses, which they always wore fishing. Flossie always hung out with us at the lodge playing cards and telling stories. She was a waitress at the Castle Royale, a speakeasy on the west side of St. Paul during Prohibition. She said she always loved it when the Chicago gangsters came to town because of the big tips. During the summer of 1960, at the age of 13, after several years of riding along just as a helper, I worked at the resort during driving a 1946 Chevy truck with a big four-on-the-floor stick shift, running boards, and a crank-open windshield. I split and delivered wood, picked up garbage, and hauled it to the resort dump, loaded sand to fill in the roads with the washouts. I cut grass, washed and hung out sheets to dry for 14 cabins, took care of the fishing boats, sold bait, washed dishes at the lodge in the evenings, and walked kids to their cabins at night. Also, I ran mouse traps at night in any vacant cabins. It sounds like a lot of work, but the trick was to enlist the help of the boys and girls vacationing at the resort to help on most of the chores. I learned this well from Vernon Hobby Hobby Horse, who I often help during our summer vacations. During the early 1950s, uh, we had front row seats to watch the workers with their machines rip up the streetcar tracks and remove the brick pavers. I remember taking the streetcar for a nickel with my mom on shopping trips downtown during the holidays. But my favorite streetcar was a Selby Lake Line. My Aunt Ruth would take me, well, take us downtown, and we'd go through the tunnel by the cathedral. What a great trip. My mom and dad were hardworking, loving parents who taught us important values and a solid work ethic. Both of my parents hunted and fished together, and we would often hunt grouse and pheasants as a family. I know my dad didn't make a lot of money. We all knew he and mom would sacrifice and save to take us up north every year. It was mom who introduced my dad to the Bacchus Pine River Hackensack area after they met at Ward's and dad told her he enjoyed fishing and hunting. When mom was little she stayed with her best friend Eric at her dairy farm by Brockway Creek where they would swim under the culvert, ride horses, and I'm sure they milked cows. My mother-in-law, Katie Colstock, knew how much Erica's farm meant to our family and in 1979 she painted me a wonderful watercolor of the old barn. My sisters taught me how to dance to rock and roll, used me to practice new dance steps they learned from watching Dick Clark's American Bandstand. I learned the bunny hop and the stroll. Came in handy during high school mixers. They call them dances now. My brother David and Martin served the first mass at Immaculate Heart of Mary in the Upper Church in 1950. David went on to earn a PhD in chemical engineering and he worked for NASA. He was part of the Apollo 11 mission and received a presidential award for his management talents in aeronautics. My brother Martin, usually referred to as Marty or Lenny by Aunt Ruth and Aunt Mary, was very special to me for his entire life. He taught me how to box, comb my hair, smoke, hunt and fish. I worked a janitorial job with him in addition to my job at Ward's. I remember he would take me with him on dates when I was little, usually to the Ranham to bowl. He would dress me up in a good shirt and a clip-on bow tie. I survived high school. At our 50 reunion, a few of the alums remembered me as a badass during my years at Creighton. To my junior year, I mostly hung out with older guys from Monroe and West 7th Street and Sibley Plaza, or at Hamlet and St. Clair. I got in a lot of trouble and a lot of gang fights, a couple of which led to visits to the emergency room. Once I had my head shaved in front and back so I could get stitched up from two blows from a tire iron and a hammer, uh, I had the nickname Patches for about a month or more at CD, at Creighton. My junior year, my life changed. I realized I needed to make some changes in my life and find new friends. My brother Marty and brother Richard stepped in to help. I had reached a turning point. Brother Richard, the principal at Creighton, was a big man, tough and respected. 
He was aware of the fights and trouble I was in during my sophomore year. One day I was walking down the hall in the new building when all of a sudden he was beside me and put me in a headlock. We need to talk, he said, and escorted me to his office. We talked for quite a while. I thought I was in trouble, but he was concerned about me. My brother Marty, graduated in 55, had moved to California and called him and was worried about the trouble I was getting into. He asked brother to look after me. Brother Richard told me about my brother's concern and then told me the story about Sonny Liston. He was a great heavyweight boxer, but he served time in prison during his prime. He remained a thug and lost respect even when he took the title from Floyd Patterson. I got the message plain and simple. and With brother's help, I was able to turn things around. I really felt that he cared. He kept tabs on me and let me know how pleased he was when he heard things, when he heard good things about me. I'm so grateful the Christian brothers at Creighton, especially Brother Richard and my brother Marty, cared enough to intervene in my life. Teaching at Creighton Durham Hall these past 10 years, I'm always mindful of students who are struggling and appear to be getting in trouble like I did. In 1967, after my third year at the University of Minnesota, I joined the Army. I volunteered to go to Vietnam, but the recruiters noticed I had studied Latin and Spanish and encouraged me to take the language aptitude test, which I maxed. They offered me a choice of language if I volunteered for four years instead of three. I chose Russian. After basic training at Fort Leonard Wood in the Missouri Ozarks, I was assigned to the Defense Language Institute, DLI, in Monterey, California, to become a Russian interpreter translator for the Army Security Agency. This kept me out of Vietnam and was a turning point that saved my life. I transcribed Russian military communications verbatim on a Russian Cyrillic typewriter. Also, I would use an English typewriter to paraphrase low-level intelligence. Daily, my transcripts would be electronically coded and sent to the National Security Agency headquarters in Frankfurt. My original type copy was put in bags and burned at the end of the shift by security marines. I worked in small towns and lived in an apartment and wore civilian clothes. I did live on a German chicken farm in Gartow at the East German border uh, along the Elbe River for about five months. We got cheap eggs, fed the hogs, and watched a stork family grow up across the road on the top edge of the barn. I learned German because very few spoke English in the small hamlets where I worked. If you wanted to shop for groceries, bakery goods, and other essentials, you needed to speak German. Oh yeah, and to meet girls. I returned home from Germany in May of 1971. I went back to my warehouse job at Wards, which was guaranteed along with raises since 1967 when I enlisted. I also soon picked up my studies at the U of M. The GI Bill paid all my tuition, and I even got extra money for family needs after Mary Beth and I got married in 1974. I got a job with the Postal Service in 1975. Uh, in 1978, I was elected local president for the American Postal Workers Union and decided to run for national office in 1983. I was elected the National Business Agent for Support Services in 1983. I successfully held the position through elections over three years uh, every three years until I retired in 2004. I was responsible for negotiating contracts, arbitration advocacy, and training stewards and local officers. I argued over 600 arbitration cases at the local and national levels. In 1998, ABW President Mo Biller and the Executive Board appointed me to lead the National Private Sector Organizing Committee. We successfully began organizing postal workers in the private sector in trucking firms and at mail transportation equipment centers. I led a number of strikes in Memphis, Dallas, Baton Rouge, Jacksonville, and Little Rock. Little Rock. We lost some and won some. This was one of the most challenging but inspiring assignments I had with APWU. It was on April 4th, the anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination in 1968, when we served notice to the J.E. and H.B. Phillips companies that we were on strike. The Reverend Billy Kyles, who was with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he was assassinated, met with the drivers in the morning to support them. He recalled that Dr. King came to Memphis on April 3rd to support the sanitation worker strike. He said, Martin Luther King died helping union workers organize. 
I learned an important lesson from my years directing the organizing campaigns and walking with courageous strikers on the picket lines. Workers do want better wages and benefits, but at the core of their struggle is a simple demand for dignity and respect. In 1999, I attended the battle in Seattle to protest along with 50,000 unionist and environmental and social justice advocates against the World Trade Organization, the WTO. About 150 union members from Minnesota, along with Senator Paul Wellstone, traveled to Seattle. Senator Wellstone conducted a teach-in about the World Trade Organization. I'll always remember when he introduced our play, The Spirit of Iqbal, at McAllister College. Seattle was a turning point for me, and I would suggest also for our country. Sadly, the media were drawn mostly to the anarchists who disrupted the event with violence. Nevertheless, I'll never forget when 50,000 folks sat down in total silence and shut down the main streets in Seattle. This is when I became deeply aware of the peaceful, the power of peaceful, nonviolent civil disobedience. On November 23, 2003, I participated in the protest against the World Trade Minister's meeting in Miami, Florida. Again, with a large delegation from Minnesota, we joined 15,000 unionists and their families mostly from AFL-CIO affiliates, to fight against the agreement to set up a free trade area of the Americas known as the FTAA. The agreement would reward corporations but hurt workers in the environment. According to the New York Times, the protests brought together many of the same groups that held a huge demonstration in Seattle in 1999 at a meeting of the World Trade Organization. Union members, environmentalists, human rights groups, animal rights groups, and trade activists there were approximately a thousand activists, including me, who left Miami to attend the School of the Americas Watch Vigil in Columbus, Georgia. The Miami events led me to take a more serious turn at Fort Benning, where I was arrested. In 1996, I helped organize a demonstration at the Mall of America to protest Postmark America. This was a postal service retail store that hired non-union workers contrary to their initial promises to hire postal workers. They sold mostly toys and clothes made in China, Singapore, Jamaica, and Mexico, even the iconic stuffed Patriot Bear, whose costume included an American flag. I was wearing a wireless microphone and recorded by attorneys who followed me into the MOA. They were considering making a case for free speech at the mall if we were denied access to Postmark America, and they wanted to build an evidentiary record. We gave several interviews to members of the press, both print and TV, and I gave an in-depth interview on KFAI TV, or KFAI radio. On Sunday, Sunday, December 15th, following a storm that dropped 10 inches of snow, 150 protesters rallied uh, near the mall and took an allotment of 10 bags apiece and entered the mall through different entrances. In some 10 minutes, they distributed 1,500 bags in political messages with the uh, Christmas bag saying, no, 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 instead of ho, 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 but no to child labor, no to restrictions on free press, no to non-union workers. In the short term, um, well, we were successful, and in the short term, the Postal Service shut down Postmark America. In the long term, the Postal Service partnered with other companies to sell its products with APWU representative employees. Our children, and as well as our grandchildren, have often um, demonstrated with me and Mary Beth at various events, whether it's to save Postal Service jobs or to promote legislation for gun safety. Uh, often we have joined those on the uh, bridge on every Wednesday at 5 on the Lake Street Bridge to promote peace. And often we are lucky to meet with the Sisters of St. Joseph of Karen Delay. And of course, other larger events like the March for Science. We find these to be very special times. On our justice trip to El Salvador, I stayed with a wonderful family in the lowlands who welcomed me into their daily life. They grew bananas and raised cattle. Jesus and Alejandra would meet me in the morning with stories and a breakfast of tortillas and homemade cheese. Jesus had worked for a number of years in New York during the fall harvest. He told me how much he enjoyed the coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. He was so proud of his family and his banana fields. He would meet me every morning at sunrise on the porch where I slept in a hammock. He would put down his three-legged stool and sit on it, throwing corn for the chickens. 
were coming down from their roosts in the coconut trees, and he would greet me with a big smile. He would ask, Buenos dias, Gregorio. Do you want to go to Dunkin' Donuts? We would laugh ourselves silly, knowing we were so isolated. I'll remember the morning their son, Leonid, rode in on his horse and tied up next to the outdoor kitchen. He had been up since sunrise, clearing and fencing off a new field for the cattle. He took his machete, sliced the top of a coconut, and poured me a wonderful glass of coconut milk. While in San Lucas Talaman, the mountains in northern Guatemala, I took morning walks to catch the sunrise and begin my days with the local indigenous people, who students invariably described as people with so little and yet with so much happiness. I wrote a prayer for one of our morning breakfasts. I'll just read the ending. The day begins to warm. I take the steep road back to the mission. I'm lifted, lifted up by the strength of a weathered old man carrying an enormous load of wood over his shoulder, hunched over in perfect balance. He smiles. Buenos dias, buenos dias. I am remen <clears throat> reminded how St. Teresa lived, doing the little things in life well and with love for God. In the fall of 2015, my friend and colleague Becky Medellin and I chaperoned eight CDH students on the El Otro Lado Immersion Experience coordinated by San Miguel High School in Tucson, Arizona. We toured the Border Patrol headquarters, an operation that covers 9,000 square miles and employs over 22,000 agents. It was absolutely clear how difficult it is not only to cross the border, but able to traverse the, uh, traverse the Sonoran Desert, which is patrolled by agents, drones, helicopters, and ground sensors. From 1999 to 2016, Human Borders documented 3,087 deaths in the Sonoran Desert. John a Quaker guide led us for a day's trek into the desert to make water and food drops along the migrant trails. He brought us to an altar in a small nook in the rocks protected from the elements where migrants left personal items, rosaries, photos, crosses, and holy cards. We also followed the desperate path Joselina Melith Hernandez Quinteras took, and we visited the remote site where she died alone in the desert. She was a 14-year-old Salvadoran who wanted to make it to Hollywood to be with her mom who had earned enough money to pay coyotes to bring her and her brother across the border. She became very ill and couldn't continue. She told her brother to continue on, and when he reached the highway to call their mother, who would send help. He made it to the highway and called. John said they got the call, and he and other good Samaritans searched for weeks until they found her body. John said she was going downhill, like all animals do, and like most of us would do to find water. The book, The Death of Husseline, tells of her tragic story. You know, there is something holding a place where it is safe to tell your story. We experienced it, this at El Comedor when we later visited the Women's Center and when we later visited the Women's Center. We met with a group of five women who shared their personal stories. One of the young women, who had two children living in Minnesota, was raped on both sides of the border. She paid $6,000 to Coyotes to get her across the border and told us she would try again to be with her children. This brought us all to tears. As with other justice education trips, I was so encouraged by the students who returned with their lives transformed by these experiences. When you meet face to face with such good people who struggle so courageously for their families and for their lives, your commitment to justice is affirmed again and again. In November of 2018, Mary Beth and I attended the School of the Americas Watch at the border in Suentro in Nogales, Mexico and Nogales, Arizona. This was followed by an evening vigil at the massive Eloy Detention Center, a prison south of Phoenix, which holds undocumented migrants detained by U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. We joined with students, musicians, poets from New York and others to sing and give witness and voice to those held by ICE. We sang, you are not alone. And at the end of the vigil, the detainees raised and lowered their windows, window blinds in solidarity. During a rally at the Wall in Nogales, Mexico, I was delighted to meet with my dear friend, Father Roy Ujua, who founded the School of the Americas Watch. During the Vietnam War, uh, Roy was a naval officer decorated with a Purple Heart. He later became a Marino missionary priest. He was awarded the Pax Christi Award as a teacher of peace in 1997. In 1980, he moved to a Catholic worker house in Chicago where he worked with the poor. That same year, three Catholic nuns and a lay missionary, missionary two of whom were friends of Father Roy, were raped and killed in El Salvador. 
Also in 1980, Archbishop Oscar Romero was assassinated while saying Mass. Nine years later in El Salvador, six Jesuit priests were massacred, along with their housekeeper and the housekeeper's daughter. Father Roy discovered a connection between these events and the School of the Americas at Fort Benning, Georgia, where an elite unit of the Salvadoran Army was trained in torture and counterinsurgency. In 1990, he rented an apartment near the entrance called Casa Romero and founded the SOA to educate the public. I've known Roy since 1999 and remains a powerful inspiration in my life. I learned so much from Roy, from his sacrifices, his times in federal prison for prayerful, nonviolent civil disobedient actions against the SOA, and his leadership. It was during the war that he felt called to be a priest. During his off-duty time, he would care for South Vietnamese orphans. I suggest everyone read Disturbing the Peace, the story of Father Roy Bourgeois and the movement to close the School of the Americas. My wife, Mary Beth, our children and grandchildren have made some of the yearly trips to the School of the Americas watch vigil. Mary Beth has also become good friends with Father Roy and especially the Sisters of St. Joseph of Cadendolet, who she got to know at uh, vigils and at the peace demonstrations on the Marshall Lake Street Bridge. She is such a blessing to me and our family. 38 years ago, she saved my life and never gave up on me. She's my hero. Jackie Boer and I chaperoned students to the School of the Americas Watch Vigil, I think it was in 2008, where we honored Blessed James Miller on placards that the students hung on the gates at Fort Benning. As with other justice education trips, it was the students who so inspired us, knowing the good neighbor and his reflections of Catholic social teaching. I will never forget the profound feeling of peace I felt when I crossed over the wall at Fort Benning and sat in prayer, waiting for the military to arrive and take us to the U.S. Marshals for processing. We had just finished singing Amazing Grace along with Pete Seeger at the morning vigil. I was in good company and honored to trespass with priests, ministers, Catholic workers, students, Quakers, social justice advocates, teachers, friendly Buddhists from, <laughs> from the University of St. Thomas, and Kathy Kelly, Catholic theologian and courageous peace activist, known for voices in the wilderness and currently voices for creative nonviolence. And I'm so grateful to the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet, who I got to know over the years at the School of the America Watch Vigils and on Marshall Avenue Lake Street Bridge on the peace demonstrations on Wednesdays. They supported me with a prayer service prior to my trial and a going away press conference at St. Catherine University the day I reported to prison. Sisters Rita Steinhagen and Betty McKenzie also offered their encouragement and support at the St. Mark's prayer service for me, my family and others who were for arrested and facing prison terms. Rita, Rita and Betty both served six months in the federal prison in Pekin, Illinois, for their actions at Fort Benning. Father Brian O'Rourke and the Peace and Justice Committee sponsored the service. I was blessed to be able to explain my actions in the context of our church community, especially to my grandkids who lit candles on the altar railing for all of us who were arrested. The event was covered in the Catholic Spirit, January 15, 2004 issue. One of the nuns at uh, St. Catherine's press conference on the day I reported to prison held me by my hands and told me not to worry that I would be surrounded by angels. Well, I found my angels in prison, where I learned there is so much good in each of us. My bunkie, Charles Thirdkill, or Third, and John Thomas, who had a Cadillac that is a separate bed in the corner that you get after many years of seniority, looked after me and told me I was in a good hood. Randy Kolajai asked me to sponsor him in the alcohol and drug recovery program. In our photos, we usually don't show our hands because you will not get photos back if the guards think you are flashing gang signs. All faiths are respected by law at federal prisons. I went to mass and often no priest was available, so they would offer a video, but we would rather have one of the inmates. We called him Catholic John. He did a prayer service on the readings in the gospel for the day. He really connected with the inmates. I traded books and stories with Native Americans in my area and was invited to attend their sweat lodge ceremonies. I don't think I've ever been to such an amazing spiritual experience in my life. One Sunday, I attended a 28-stone sweat 
to honor our mothers, sisters, and wives on Mother's Day. I wrote to Mary Beth's mother, Katie, to describe the ceremony. I would just share one story in the circle. Poor Bear, whom I met in the AA meetings, conducted the sweat and led the discussion. During the second round, while we passed the peace pipe, he spoke about how his father taught him to be a good warrior. He prayed how he also wanted to teach his son to be a good warrior, a warrior who stood against drugs and alcohol on the reservation. It was very moving, and when the pipe passed to me, I offered my prayer for my grandson and his dad, who was serving time in St. Cloud for guns and drugs. I remember that special day in 2019 when Mary Beth and I attended his AA meeting where he received his medallion for one year of sobriety. In the sweat lodge, we didn't pray in the Christian sense. We prayed to our ancestors. So I thought a lot about my mom and dad. After you speak in the circle or pass the peace pipe to the next person, you say in Lakota, Mitakwe Washin, which means we are all related. My friend sister Rita Steinhagen, a sister of St. Joseph of Carindalee, wrote to me while I was in prison. A few weeks before I got out, she shared a letter she had received about the last day being in prison. It read as follows. That first full breath of freedom beyond the last door of the prison will be something you will cherish immensely and always remember. But no matter how joyous that occasion, as you walk across the parking lot, a piece of your heart will remain with friends that you are leaving behind. There's nothing that anyone can do or say to lessen this pain for you. Sister Rita's book, Hooked by, um, Caught by the Spirit, Hooked by the Spirit, Journey of a Peaceful Activist, is a very moving account of her commitment to justice and her eventual journey as a peacemaker. I encourage all to read her story and find hope in these difficult times. And you'll catch a smile when you see the photos of the fish she caught in her visits to the northern Minnesota lakes. The last day of my sentence is on what inmates call the merry ground. You have a card that authorizes you to go to the various buildings and offices to check out. The guards have to let you pass. The last stop is downstairs to get your belongings and street clothes. Mary Beth had mailed mine just days before. It was when I took the elevator to the main floor and got out that I was alone for the first time in three months. I knew Mary Beth and my granddaughter Izzy were waiting in the parking lot. And down the hall in the other directions were my friends I would never see again. It was then that I broke down and cried. Such special times, conflicting feelings of freedom and lost friendships. Well, thank you, Greg, for sharing that amazing video with us. Um, is there anything you want to add before we start to solicit questions? Uh, no, just, uh, you know, thanks for all the, the help I had on this. And this is adapted from a film that I did for my classes at Creighton Durham Hall, my justice classes, as well as uh, uh, some of my senior classes where we, I would show them some of the parts of my life and the people who impacted my life. And generally I looked at probably a little bit more in the focus of Catholic social teaching because of where I was at and the discussions that we had in classes. Um, I, I'm just, I feel so fortunate, Greg, that you have been in, in my life for so long and it, it's such you tell such a powerful story and um i i want to invite uh people to type questions into the chat on zoom or the comment function on facebook if that's where you are um one question came in already greg someone wanted to know who was the waitress at the castle royale yeah that was my my grandmother flossie o'donnell uh -huh. uh, on the Irish side of my family. And she was a storyteller and she was a spitfire, but it was really funny because the kids we'd always have to ask going, who's she talking about? And she talks about those coming to town. She was so happy to see those 
folks from Chicago. And then what's so my mom? See, she's talking about the gangsters. They had come to the Castle Royale in the 30s during Prohibition. Also, she waitress at the St. Paul Hotel, where a lot of them uh, stayed. You know, when they came to St. Paul to enjoy hunting and fishing and promised uh, the uh, sheriff and the town that there'd be no bank robbery and no killings. And there was just one slip up at the Castle Royale where somebody was machine gunned and they covered it up and the police from St. Paul came in and made it like it didn't happen, but there's still some bullet holes way in the back of the caves by the bar. So just, she was, she was amazing. So uh, the sad thing is Peter, and you know how this is, we get on in years and where you kept encouraging me about stories that I'd forgotten. I'm going, Oh shoot, I've got to write some more. And um, I think that was the wonderful support that you gave. But when you think of the stories that have gone by us and, my cousin, Steve, and others, you know, we sit around and they're all my age, you know, and we, we start talking about our grandma and grandpas and we're going, oh, I wish I would have asked Flossie more questions, you know, about the 1930s and 1940s. And there was such rich, rich history. So, yeah, that was, I saw that in the, in the, in the chat. Yes, yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. That's my grandma Donald. Okay. So, um, our dear Beth Cleary has sent in a question in the chat. You speak in the film about how powerful the justice education tours were for the students. Have you kept up with some of them? What are, what uh, are they doing now? Well, um, I've run into a, a few of the students and a lot of them that have been through the program, either the summers that or the, the falls that I chaperone, but others, uh, their stories, uh, for many of them, they've gone into um, immigration law. Uh, one of the one of the young uh, Latinas that was with our group when we went, uh, you saw her in the pictures where we we're doing the water drops and through the desert. And she was so taken back. Uh, she we went and learned the system. We went to Fort Snelling uh, to uh, to the immigration courts there. We went to the immigration courts down in Tucson. So the students kind of saw both sides. And we were always very careful to make sure that it was their experience. So I did some video and some interviews with the kids, but at the same time, we uh, let them take it all in. And I think it was a lesson for us teachers and chaperones. Uh, the students so inspired us, uh, you know, with their questions. They came back when they talk about, oh, you get informed and transformed. We saw students uh, really transformed from these uh, judges, justice education trips, totally disconnected, no media, no phones, nothing. Some of them lived on farms as I did for three days down in the lowlands of El Salvador with a family, outdoor biffies, uh, bucket, bucket bass. And um, some of them uh, were a little bit fearful going in to these farms because it was like a commune. In fact, they had bread ovens with the FMLA on the side stenciled. So you've got remnants of the, you know, recollections of the Civil mm -hmm. War. But uh, the students, uh, when we went to pick them up from their respective farms, uh, hugs, tears, stories, uh, uh, it's just one of the most valuable experiences. We had to stop them um, the last year that I was at the school, because I was on the chair of the Justice Education Trip Committee. And that was when they started shooting the bus drivers in El Salvador. And we had to cancel the trip that year. I'm glad that we did. We met with the parents because there's a lot of investment in it and a lot of anticipation, a lot of training, a lot of study, a lot of uh, reflection uh, before we go. But it's just been too dangerous. Same with Guatemala where we go, uh, up in uh, San Lucas Talaman. But um, yeah, uh, many of the students are changed by that. And you hear stories of them, like I said, not just the students that I was with um, that went in immigration law, came back and wrote letters in the Creighton Durham Hall newsletters. Uh, they, they had classes, they went and visited other classes to tell their stories. So they really took ownership of their transformation. And we hear stories from so many other students uh, similarly. And what I said in the book and in the film is, we would sit up on, when we were in Guatemala, we would go up on the hotel uh, Iketu and we would have a candle vigil. 
everybody would do a check-in, you know, volcanoes and the stars and uh, how was your day? You know, what did you learn from the day? And one of the continuing reflections we got back from the students is they have nothing. They just have nothing and yet they're so happy. And I think that just really um, was enlightening to the students to see that different part of the world, total poverty, dirt, little dirt roads, tin shacks, kids uh, sitting with their grandfather, um, pounding stones. Um, so uh, it was just a remarkable experience. And we heard it firsthand from the students on all those trips. So that's it. I go on too much. No, no. <laughs> So one of the things that you didn't go on enough about, I think, uh, was the Solidarity Kids Theater um, oh. and the, the, the play The Spirit of Iqbal and the play about the Lee family. Um, we noticed the big eagle puppet in the, in the video. Um, I wonder, would, would you say a little bit about one of your former students whom we met in the Solidarity Kids Theater, Ryan Harris, and, yeah, and what Ryan has gone on to do with his life. Yeah, or, or our daughter, um, Hannah, or um, um, Craig Kielberger from Free the Children. They were all in their teens, 12, yes. 13 years old, 14 years old. And um, most of the, we started in 1994 at the Meeting the Challenge conferences that Peter and I used to, along with uh, cohorts and activists in the Twin Cities, educators, unionists, uh, we would have uh, annual seminars at McAllister. And we started to involve our families and children by doing, we started out with art and music and dance and picket signs. And then we went to um, the Solidarity Kids Theater in 1995. So, uh, you know, we were celebrating a 25 year anniversary, um, but, um, and we're still doing puppet theater. Uh, last year, we did uh, the puppet theater over at St. Peter Claver, Mary Beth and I, when we volunteered with the after school program, when they cut out their arts and language, we went over and once a week, we, uh, we taught them art and puppets. Ryan Harris, um, who retired um, after the Denver Broncos won the Super Bowl, uh, during high school when he was at Creighton Durham. When he was in ninth grade, he would toured with us. Uh, Peter, you saw him when we were down in Manhattan, Kansas at the educational seminars. But I remember his parents were teachers and went, and they just lived two blocks over in Hague. And they, we had the University of Minnesota vans loading up all the kids to go down to Kansas. And, I, and this was when he was in eighth grade. All the kids thought he was like about 18 years old. You know, I think he was six, five then. And by high school, he's 6'7", 250 pounds, goes to Notre Dame, excels in studies and football, and then um, professional football uh, career. And now he uh, uh, has a radio station and blogs. But the thing that's significant, you remember this, Peter, he wrote uh, when they were the Muslim ban. He was really outspoken on that. He was at a Catholic high school, and he uh, became a Muslim uh, in high school and uh, changed his faith. And I, one of the students asked him after he t spoke to the school, they said, anybody give you any trouble? And he goes, I was like six, seven, 250 at the time. Nobody really gave me much trouble. You know what I mean? He was just, just a good kid. But, uh, and then our daughter, um, Hannah, who is, I see her, she's online. She, um, she traveled, she did a lot of the shows in Washington, DC, uh, you know, wherever we were doing, we did these around the country. And we did different themes, but they're always labor themes, child labor, immigration, postal privatization, gangs in the schools, uh, Iqbal, you know, the, the spirit of Iqbal, our major play that we did. But um, Hannah went on, um, and I think um, uh, she's now with the New York Times, the youngest um, um, editor on the masthead. So uh, we're really proud of her. And then Craig Kuberger who was at uh, the University of Minnesota, we held a youth conference. And I think Peter, you were there. It was a couple day conference. Kids came from, from out East and um, we were at the Humphrey Forum. And I remember Doug Grow was there and the kids called a press conference. So you had a lot of the media, the TV shows and the Hannah, um, Brian, Ryan Harris, 
Craig Kielberger, um, there was a couple of the other, uh, I'll come up with their names. There was about seven of the kids. And after they did their presentation, Doug Grove uh, from the Star Tribune goes, you know, I think I speak for everybody in this room when we look at the two young people and we just really see the future leaders of tomorrow. And the kids were really quiet and they looked over to Craig and Craig goes, uh, well, we tend to think of ourselves as leaders of today. And it just, it just stunned the room. I mean, that's where these kids were at. So we always think that as educators, we're, you know, we're the sage on the stage. We're teaching all these kids, these wonderful things. They're giving us so much and they're, they're teaching us so much that we're, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's um, that's our experience, and you know what I'm talking about, Peter. Yeah. So um, our dear friend Ricardo Levis Morales has raised his mechanical hand. Uh, Carla, can you unmute him, and and maybe even allow him to show his handsome mug, uh, and and he can say what he has to say. Can we oh, do that, Ricardo? Yeah, and, just, and just as a prelim, yeah. um, Olivia is covered in the book. <laughs> and, and her mural that she did um, in Minneapolis, she's just an amazing muralist. She was with the Solidarity Kids right. from the very beginning. Yeah, and the connection is that she's my daughter. Yes. yes. For those who don't know. <laughs> and I raised my mechanical hand apparently because I moved my mechanical mouth to the side while uh -oh. working on the art that it won't surprise you that I'm doing. And I had no idea that I'd raised my hand, Peter, until you said that I had. So all I can really have to say is thank you. This is wonderful. And I'm just soaking it up. Thank you, Thanks. Ricardo. And Thanks. you're such, Ricardo's been such an important part of, of this whole story. Um, so there's a question in the chat. If you could say more about your parents, Greg, and, and the role that they might have played in getting you on this path that you've been on all these years. That's, you know, that's a, that's an interesting question because, you know, my dad was a manager at Montgomery Wards and um, he had a third grade education. He came in from the farm and um, when he was 16 and started working at Wards um, Latin was there for the next 49 years. I think one of the things that uh, as far as it's been formative and what I always appreciated so much about my parents is one, my faith, my Catholic faith. And second of all, um, you know, I used to hunt and fish with my mom and dad. Um, I would be out on the line in the woods with my mom and she would help teach me how to hunt and um, mostly, you know, grouse and uh, duck and pheasant. But um, they gave us that summer vacation um, every year that I think just we all just think back on those times up at the lakes. They'd take us to the cabin. And I know that my parents didn't have a lot of money. They would make sure that they would have enough money to take us kids up to the lake every summer for a week or two. And so I'm going up next week for a vacation. I'm actually taking um, um, canning equipment and I'm gonna be doing some canning up there, tomatoes. And uh, I already did pickles, but we were laughing because I said, I'm gonna go up and visit with my mom. Because my mom and Flossie, Grandma O'Donnell, when they would go on vacation, <laughs> they, they would go and pick pin cherries and choke cherries. And we'd be swimming at the beach and they'd do all their canning when they're on vacation, you know, just visit and canning. So um, I learned so much uh, from both my mom and dad. And, um, you know, they, they were they didn't have a radical bone in their body do you know what i mean they were just workaday folks you know my mom did a lot of voluntary in the church she was an amazing uh cook and baker and, and baker and uh just good people and i and i feel that that's part of me always part of me and whenever i'm baking um i'm always uh, conversing i'm connecting with my mom when i'm up on the lake out in the woods or when i'm fishing I always say hello to Herman, my dad. So, you know, they stay with you. So there must be something pretty powerful that uh, they shared with me, so. So um, I think I'm gonna ask one question and then maybe we can open things up. Um, 
what was it like for you to write this book, Greg? To, that you have not been a writer. Uh, we want to encourage people to tell their own stories in whatever forms uh, they're comfortable with. But what was it like for you to write this book? I think it was a challenge, but after a while, it was kind of a joy because um, I didn't have any deadlines. Yeah. And, and I always used to uh, just tell you a quick story, you know, if I, I don't know how much more I can thank Jenny Marker, you know, the, the editor and my friend, because I thought I could write fairly well. When I back, went back to college after um, so many years, I went, when I retired from the postal workers, I don't know, I wrote hundreds of briefs, 20, 30 page briefs with all the, with all the attachments and everything else. I worked with lawyers where I remember Sue Catler, she was assigned to me. So after I did a national level case and I did a, my first brief, they have to, back then they would use red, right? You know, they would have all of that shorthand and they'd mark it up with a red pen. And um, <laughs> I got my first brief back and it was just all marked up. And I went to see her up at the law offices and I said, Susan, she said, I said, What's, she says, have you ever thought like maybe using English? <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was that was the beginning of like, yeah, I'm going to get this down, which I did after a year. I got a brief buyer, like only had a couple marks on it. Second of all, fast forward, I, I got interested in writing when I did the 1894 um, Pullman strike and Charlie Luth, you know, the murder of Charlie Luth and Dave really, um, Connor's brother, um, I did a senior paper at the University of St. Thomas on the Pullman strike. And I spent a year of research trying to answer the final question of why wouldn't the Catholic church bury this young man, you know? Mm. And mm. Um, so I finished the paper and then Dave really, um, all of a sudden the Ramsey County Historical Society called me and they wanted me to um, meet with the editor and to write it for publication in their magazine. And I went, whoa. And I met with the editor and he goes, he says, I read your paper. He says, I know you put a lot of work in it. He said, but do you mind if I beat you up a little bit? And I says, you know, I'm thinking of Susan Catler, the attorney. I'm going, oh, it's the fastest learning tracks I've ever been on. I spent a whole summer with him doing drafts and redrafts. And I went, and I was really proud of that. It was, he really helped me, you know. So anyway, when I got to writing the book, I thought, I've met so many cool people, so many people that have impacted my life that a lot of them were my turning points. I include you in that and other friends. And I wish I could have written a longer book about all of those, all the good people. And I think that's what motivated me, but I wanted to share those stories with my family and especially the grandkids. So maybe when, when I'm gone, some of you will pick up a book and maybe find a good labor history lesson in there or a lesson about faith or about sobriety. Um, you know, I'm going on what, um, 39, almost 40 years of sobriety, which is pretty cool. And I thank my wife sitting next to me for coming in and saving me so many years back. But anyway, um, I just thought it'd be uh, good to put it down. And then once I got started, um, you know, I thought, yeah, there's some stories. And I love stories. I love telling stories. And so I try to do my best. And then uh, the editor and then you all of a sudden gave me much, much more work to do. And then my editor, she made me write another story about one of the kids. She says, how come you don't have a story for Jeff? You wrote stories for all the kids, where's Jeff's? And I says, he lost it. She says, and then, so the week later she goes, so have you written another story yet? So she would just keep pushing me along, but very encouraging as you were too. You need encouragement because it's, it's kind of like, you know, is this going to be good enough or whatever? But um, hey, you know, I'm going I'm to get it done. So, well, we have uh, two people at the moment, two elders, coming into the library to write, and they're both reading your book as inspiration uh, to get them to tell their stories. Oh, good. So, um, the 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 impact continues. <laughs> 